Good afternoon. Uh, Happy New Year to many of you. Um, welcome to our What's Buzzing at Georgia Tech webinar series as we are excited to kick off a brand new semester, spring 2022. Um, boy, where has the time gone? Um, we are so excited to be joined today by a very special guest, um, our AVP and Dean of Students, uh, Dean Stein. Um, taking the time I scheduled to just kind of meet with you, um, share a couple of things. Um, also, he would like to hear from you as well. Um, any questions or concerns that you may have, we would love to for you to post those in our chat, in our Q&A chat, so that way we can address them and just kind of hear your concerns. Uh, we would love to hear how your students doing, how they're transitioning into a new semester, um, just how we can support them. Uh, we are so excited to have you just joining us here today. Uh, my name is Tyler, for those of you all maybe joining us for the first time. I serve as a coordinator within the Office of Parent and Family Programs. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Dean John Stein. Well, good afternoon uh, from Georgia Tech and from my office here in Atlanta. Um, and I want to echo Happy New Year. Um, I hope you all had uh, some really enjoyable and relaxing holidays and are navigating uh, life uh, as best you can at this point in light of everything that's going on. Um, we are back uh, fully and uh, we are already, believe it or not, in our third week of the semester. Um, and time does go by pretty quickly here. Um, what I always like to do initially is to just kind of place us where we are so you know where your student is in relation to the semester. So. As I said, we're in week three. Classes started on January 10th. That was our first day of classes. That first week is an add drop period, so there's a lot of movement uh, back and forth and in between classes and stuff. But at this point, schedule should be um, complete. Uh, students should know the courses they're in. I did hear this morning from some faculty that uh, students are not showing up and they're not sure if that means that the student has made a decision to not continue in the class or so uh, you might want to check with your student to make sure that they are attending whether in person or virtually and if they have made the decision to not stay in that class that they officially withdraw from the class otherwise they're still on the roster and the faculty member is still expecting uh, that they'll be in class okay so let's just check on that uh, we had our first break on January 17th, MLK Day, um, and now we are in the long stretch. And I think uh, some of you may have been on a uh, virtual uh, meeting with me last semester when I spoke about the difference between fall and spring. There is a significant difference between the two semesters. The fall term offers a lot more short breaks along the way spring semester we have the one day off and then we enter an eight week uh, marathon until we get uh, to spring break which happens the week of march 21st so it's a long run for the students faculty and everyone else um, and uh, by that time when we reach spring break everyone is ready for it uh, because they've been working really hard for the last um, eight weeks um, Along the way, a key date, March 18th, is the day that we uh, students can withdraw from individual classes. It's a very, very important date for students who want to just step out of a class uh, that may not be going so well. Now, before a student does that, um, there are some things they need to do. If they're an international student, they should be checking with OIE to make sure that there's no implications to their visa uh, or full-time status. If they're a financial aid student, they want to check to make sure that there's no implications to financial aid. OK, so before they hit that button and withdraw from the class, they just need to have a conversation or two with the right people to make sure they're making informed decisions. OK, um, and then uh, we go after spring break right up until the end. The final days of instruction are April 25th and 26th, uh, and then we shift into finals. So. That kind of gives you a sense. So um, once again, we're in that long stretch of eight weeks until spring break. Um, and so if you hear your students saying that they're tired, um, they're overworked, they are stressed um, at times, uh, it's probably true um, because the semester is, as I said, a marathon here at this time. 
Um, I do want to say that at a, in about 10 minutes or so, I've invited Dr. Holton to join us uh, from the oh. Health Center to give an update on the issue that most of us are talking about and wondering about and potentially worried about, and that's COVID. But to just give you some reassuring information about where we are on campus in relation to this issue, and then to maybe answer any questions that you have. Okay, I think that that is the topic uh, that seems to be on most people's mind right now. We figured we probably should address that very quickly. But before I do that, um, I want to kind of mention a few other things. One is on February 7th and 8th is the All Majors Career Fair. Now, this information was highlighted in the parent newsletter that you just received, and it's another plug that if you're not receiving the parent newsletter, you should be, and you should lock, register to receive it. But um, there is a very large career fair uh, that happens, um, and uh, you know your student can take advantage of that on those two days, February 7th and 8th. They do have to register for it, um, but they can easily find out that information. Um, and then uh, we always talk about a lot of the professional services that are available uh, in support through academic support, through our counseling center, uh, care and other places, the dean's office. But today I want to kind of highlight three support services that are peer support programs that are available to any student and all students. And um, you know, if your student can really benefit from a peer program, then you might want to consider these. One is a leadership coaching program. They can opt into that. They can be working with a leadership coach. Many times it's another student. It can be a graduate student they'll be working with. They are well trained and well versed and uh, students have gone through that program have really uh, talked about the benefits of it. Um, and that's something that they can look up. That's uh, done out of our LEAD program. The second is our one-to-one -one peer coaching program uh, that happens again uh, out of LEAD. Uh, uh, the peer coaching program, I'm sorry. It's the peer coaching program that happens out of the counseling center. So if uh, your student could benefit from having a conversation with another student who's again well trained, well versed, is supervised by a member of the counseling center staff, a therapist, um, but doesn't really want to talk to a therapist, but just would like to talk to another student. Many times students that come into that um, service are talking about the experience of Georgia Tech, and it's helpful to talk to another student who's an upperclassman who's lived it and gone through it and can speak to how they, you know, work their way through this place and how they were able to kind of manage stress and um, you know connect with their faculty. So um, it doesn't have to be clinical in nature. Uh, it could just be that they really want to talk how to make friends, how to make connections on campus, um, how to prepare themselves for uh, a career fair. And then the third uh, peer education program is Healthy Jackets that's run out of um, the health initiatives program uh, that works with students in doing presentations and can work with individual students on kind of creating healthy plans for themselves. There are a lot of students like many of us that start a new calendar year with resolutions uh, or goals. And the question is how to hold on to those, how to maintain them, how to sustain them over time. Um, you know, whatever those goals are. And again, if they are within that uh, realm of health and wellness, then um, you know a healthy jacket uh, connection could benefit the student. So these are just available. Um, I wish more students would take advantage of them, quite honestly. Uh, they're wonderful programs. As I said, they're well trained, well supervised, and I think that um, many, many students would benefit from it. So just keep those in mind uh, as you talk to your student and you know, um, I'll offer them as suggestions if they're, uh, you know, having a little bit of a difficult time. Okay. Um, you know how to reach me um, in the Dean's office. If you need anything, feel free to email me uh, and I'd be happy uh, to talk individually with you about a specific situation involving your student. But at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Holton, uh, who 
has done a heroic job here uh, for the last two and a half years or so, it's been losing track of time, but has really helped Georgia Tech manage this whole situation and has really been wonderful in working with the staff, faculty, and students to give us an update. Dr. Hull. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Dean Stein, for the opportunity to uh, speak um, to this group. Um, in terms of kind of where Georgia Tech stands with cases, um, as I'm sure all of you are aware, um, the Omicron variant has uh, taken the U.S. by storm, and we are seeing that here on campus as well. We we actually had quite a good fall semester. We had relatively low numbers of cases on campus and stayed consistently low all the way through um, the last week of the semester, kind of like two days before um, uh, graduation in the for fall semester. We started seeing an uptick in cases on campus, and that was related to the Omicron variant. Um, and um, students returned to campus on uh, the, at the beginning of spring semester. We um, continued to see a um, increase in cases. That's actually a pattern we've seen at the beginning of each semester since uh, COVID first started. Uh, the peak this semester is more dramatic because of the uh, increased transmiss transmissibility of Omicron. More students came back to campus with it, um, uh, and then it spread a little bit more easily. However, we have seen that our cases on campus have, have peaked, and we um, started a decline in cases. Hey, Dr. Holton, would you mind increasing your volume on your computer? Sure. Um, I, I can speak a little bit louder, too. OK. <laughs> we have seen a, a peak in our case on campus uh, about a week and a half ago, and since then we've seen a, a steady decline in cases. We've seen a decrease in um, uh, testing requirements here at the health center. We've seen a decrease in testing requirements, symptomatic testing requirements through our surveillance lab. So those are all promising trends. We've seen a decrease in the positivity rate with our um, surveillance testing. So th those are positive trends in terms of where we're headed for this semester. Um, we have augmented our testing capabilities here on campus. So for the past two years, um, we have had a, a, a two-pronged approach to testing on campus. We have had an asymptomatic testing program for faculty, staff, and students um, uh, that allowed our uh, community to get tested on a regular basis. It's not mandated, but it is highly encouraged. And we've made it very easy for uh, our uh, student body to get tested for COVID. That's allowed us to do effective um, contact tracing and um, isolation and quarantine. We have also, um, through Stamps Health Services, the, the, the health, health center, offered symptomatic testing for students um, and ha have um, been able to, to facilitate students who are ill getting into isolation as well. Uh, this semester, because of the high demand for testing and the difficulty in getting testing out in the community due to high volumes, our surveillance lab, which historically has done only asymptomatic testing, added a site for symptomatic testing. Um, it is a drive up site. Um, but will can also manage um, individuals who walk up. And, and so that's been a, a mechanism by which faculty, staff, and students have been able to get symptomatic testing. That started out doing about 100 um, symptomatic tests a day and has dropped down to um, around 30 tests a day um, for the symptomatic testing. Our testing here at STAMPS um, has, has remained fairly steady at 40 to 45 symptomatic tests a day. Our positivity rate here at Stamps has been higher in January than it has been historically. And right now, our average positivity rate for January is 33% for symptomatic testing. Um, our positivity rate for um, asymptomatic surveillance testing started out at about six. Uh, this semester, it's dropped down in the, the four to 5% range. So that's, again, a positive trend in terms of um, uh, where our, our um, testing is, is headed. Um, 
In terms of isolation and quarantine, historically we have isolated and quarantined all students who um, tested positive or who had an exposure in a uh, hotel that uh, Georgia Tech um, uh, um, contracted for space. Anticipating that the number of cases would be higher this semester and that it might exceed our ability to isolate, we changed our protocol a little bit. Uh, students who are in a traditional style dorm where they have a roommate or they, they have a communal bathroom are being prioritized for our um, isolation space that's in the hotel. Students who have their own room in an apartment style um, dorm are um, isolating in, in place. Um, uh, and, and, and that was done anticipating that um, we might run out of space. So far, we have not run out of space. We've been able to isolate um, uh, individuals who needed isolation. Um, we've not run, run out of our space in the hotel, so we've been able to, 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 to successfully isolate those who needed to be isolated. Um, we have changed our contact tracing process a little bit um, just to enable us to keep up with numbers. Um, and it's do, we're doing more of it by a, an email notification as opposed to a one-on-one -on -one phone conversation that has enabled us to more efficiently reach out to those who, who needed to be notified of what to do um, if they tested positive or had been identified as a contact. Georgia Tech has had a very robust response um, to COVID in terms of mitigation measures in, in addition to our testing um, program um, and in addition, in addition to our vaccination program, this has been available to all of the um, uh, Georgia Tech community. And, and by the way, we've done over 40,000 vaccinations here on campus to our community. Um, Georgia Tech has, has invested in improving air filtration and air exchange rates in our classrooms and public spaces. Um, we have worked hard to provide students with um, masking and, and, and uh, um, this semester we have uh, provided um, faculty, staff and students with um, the more effective KN95 mask and N95 mask if, if they wanted it. Um, we have also taken steps to, to allow students to socially distance, providing uh, opportunities for them to socialize and participate in activities that are organized and planned in a, in a, ma in a manner that allows social distancing in those activities, um, but still allows them the opportunity to, to make connections with their um, uh, classmates and, and other students on campus. Um, uh, so th th those are kind of the steps that we've been taking to try to make this experience a safe one for campus. So enhancing our testing capabilities, um, providing masks, um, enhancing our isolation and quarantine opportunities uh, and uh, utilizing uh, the, the, the um, resources that we built up over the past two years to, to, to effectively assist our students with um, being safe while here on campus. Dr. Holton, if you wouldn't mind just expounding on the process for students who stay off campus and off, cam off campus apartment, what does their process look like if they test positive? So we do ask that students who have an off campus apartment that they um, isolate in place in their off campus apartment. Um, uh, th that's been our process so far. Great, thank you so much. And for the students who live on campus, test positive and are uh, moved over to the isolation hotel. Um, is there a nurse that checks on them? How many meals are they provided, um, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so students who are moved to isolation space are, are checked on by housing staff. Um, the housing staff reach out to them, check on them, make sure that they um, are doing OK if they need anything. It's my understanding that they get two meals a day um, provided uh, through Georgia Tech Dining. Um, and they do have the opportunity to uh, uh, inform dining dining if they have any special dietary needs uh, um, related to that. So they are able to you know, specify gluten free or uh, vegetarian or, or, or dietary choices like that. Great. And just for the parents who may just be new, 
um, if their student tests positive, they're in an isolation hotel. What is the process about them communicating to their professors about their course loads and things of that sort if they're unable to physically perform in the classroom? So we encourage students to reach out to professors on their own to communicate with their professors, but also um, the Dean of Students Office can uh, support students in, in communicating with their professors. It's been part of our contact tracing uh, process that um, uh, when someone who's in isolation or quarantine uh, is contacted by the contact tracing team, uh, we do ask if they want the Dean of Students Office notified, uh, and we have a process for to letting the Dean of Students Office know if a student indicates they they'd like the student the Dean of Students Office support. Let me let me just say a little bit uh, more about that. So um, Dr. Holton's been very good about updating faculty. There's a, a major meeting every Wednesday morning of uh, over like 100 faculty that uh, usually log on and stuff and keeping them posted. One of the things we've asked the faculty is to uh, accept the fact that in the moment we're in, when a student is saying they're unable to come to class due to illness, we don't have to get into the details of it to believe that. OK, now most faculty are doing that. They, they just accept that. They actually thank the student for not coming to class. There are some faculty that still say, I need the Dean of Students Office to send me uh, an email. Uh, if that happens and the student notifies my office and then either myself or one of my staff will notify the faculty that uh, we are aware of the situation and back the student up. But that's kind of how we're working it right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was actually the concern of another student because they were discussing, uh, oh, excuse me, another parent because they were saying that their daughter is saying that students are coming to class sick because they're not missing. Yeah, and, and we continue to talk to faculty about that, that we do not want students in class. Georgia Tech students really do not give themselves permission to miss class but we keep reinforcing the fact that you should not be attending class if you don't feel well, and faculty should be working with students to make up the work or have kind of access to the work or the lecture that they missed. And another uh, parent is expressing concern about the, reluct the reluctance to making uh, remote learning options available for all classes um, just due to the decrease in amount of students who are wearing masks and social distancing um, as the year has gone on. Well, I mean, look, we we can't do that. We cannot just go to a fully remote. We're doing the best we can. There are a number of exceptions that have been made to, for the right reasons uh, with faculty and stuff. But what I would say is that, um, you know, if there's a real issue with a specific class, then your students should let us know that and then we can try to address that with the faculty member uh, and the students in the class. I mean, uh, that, that's the best we can do, but um, yeah. Uh, Dr. Holton or uh, Dean Stein, you can take this next one. Students are saying that uh, many students are not testing. Uh, especially if they have COVID because they don't want to quarantine. How are you addressing this situation to kind of promote uh, students quarantining if they test positive? So um, one thing that's been helpful in that regard is that the CDC has shortened the requirements for uh, isolation and quarantine. Um, the five days versus the 10 day isolation period, and we are following that CDC guidance. Um, that does help uh, in, in, in that regard. Um, we are encouraging students to get tested when they're ill, and we're trying to make that process as easy as possible. Um, we um, are not making and cannot make testing mandatory. Uh, there's just no way to police that um, uh, or to enforce that. Um, so we, we are dependent upon students to some degree doing the right thing. Uh, we, we, we try to remove barriers to testing as much as possible. Um, we have encouraged a, uh, a culture of taking care of each other, and that includes um, not going to class when you're sick, getting tested when you're sick, wearing a mask around others. 
Is there absolute 100% compliance with that? No, but I think in general, our community has embraced that culture and embraced that ethos and students in general are trying to do the right thing. Uh, Dr. Holton, uh, a couple of parents are wanting to know how, what is the quarantine situation like for uh, our Greek students who stay on campus in the fraternity or sorority house? Um, Dean Stein may be able to speak to this a little bit better than I can, but uh, in general, the Greek houses are responsible for providing their own isolation space. Um, housing has been able to accommodate some of the Greek students to, to in some situations, particularly early on in the COVID, um, uh, uh, when, when we were first dealing with COVID. Uh, but because the Greek houses are independent, uh, um, organizations, they've been responsible for having their own COVID response plan and their own plan for isolation and quarantine of those who live there. Yeah, and you want to, I can just say that, um, let me just say that the, the, the Greeks really have been very responsive. I just want to say now again, you, if you know a specific situation or uh, incident that we should know about, please please inform us. But I, I want to really give them some credit. They have worked really well. And the students that live locally, many of them go home to quarantine. They don't even stay in the chapter house. They go home like some of our resident students in our residence halls. They're just more comfortable being at home with their families. If the circumstances allow them to go back home, uh, there might be some reason why they shouldn't go home. But, uh, you know, I think that we're, we're working on this and it hasn't been a major issue, um, honestly. Um, I want to go back to the testing because we're tracking this very, very closely. And just this morning, uh, Dr. Holton and I were in a meeting. Last week alone, 7,200 people tested on this campus. OK, so over 7,000 people went through testing. So people and students are testing. OK, and, and I think students may believe that others are not testing, but we're seeing good evidence that they are. Uh, Dr. Hodan, I think you spoke on this earlier, but this may be for a parent who may have joined us late. Are you providing masks for students? Can they get high quality KN95 or KF94 uh, type? My student told me that classes have surgical masks in front of the classroom that don't seem to be available for students. So um, our efforts to provide KN95 masks this semester have been initially directed at faculty and staff to, to, to get those. Students are, have been provided surgical masks. Um, the Division of Student Engagement and Wellbeing is working with um, the Student Government Association and getting are purchasing uh, KN95 and N95 masks to be distributed specifically to students. Uh, so that process is, uh, we're in the midst of that process uh, of procuring those masks and getting those out to students. Um, uh, some departments uh, at the um, Institute have, have also taken the initiative to obtain KN95 masks and N95 masks to share with students as well. So uh, initial efforts uh, for the Institute have been directed at faculty and staff um, and with the goal of um, expanding that to students as more masks become available. This uh, Division of Student Engagement and Wellbeing is specifically targeting students and getting them masks, uh, KN95 and N95 masks. Great, thank you so much. Uh, what is the process for uh, obtaining medicine and food for students who stay off campus who test positive? Um, so if, if someone lives off campus in an off campus residence, um, the, the, they are going to be responsible for their obtaining their own food. They can do that through meal delivery services and uh, similar um, types of uh, um, processes. In terms of medications, uh, um, stamps can certainly fill prescriptions for them if they need it. They would need to send a friend or a roommate to, to come pick that up for them, um, but we can fill prescriptions for them if, if they have, um, you know, if, they, if they've seen a healthcare provider and that healthcare provider sends a prescription to stamps, we can, we can fill it here. 
Will you please remind us of the process of getting access to our child's health info slash doctor's info when they are sick? So um, students here at Georgia Tech, uh, if they're 18 years old or greater, are considered adults by, uh, uh, by the federal law. And so parents cannot be granted access to their medical records without the student giving consent. Um, and uh, the student will need to share their records with the parents themselves. Um, the parent, I mean, the student can sign a consent form uh, here at Stamps Health Services that allows their parents to access, um, uh, to make a request for their medical records. But uh, um, uh, in, in general principle, um, records are not shared with parents unless the student gives consent. Thank you so much, Dr. Halton. Uh, Dean Stein, I know since the beginning of the COVID, we have been pretty been firm. Pretty firm. Standard. Standard. Since the beginning of COVID, we have been pretty firm about uh, no mask mandate. Um, if you could just expound on that and the reasons why. It, uh, sure. Uh, well, the no mask mandate it really comes from the University System of Georgia. It is a, a decision that they've made for all campuses. So we, we follow their lead. Uh, they have not changed their thought on that. And so um, we are working uh, under the um, you know circumstances that we're in. Again, I, I, I do want to say that there's not a mandate, but you walk across the campus, a lot of students have masks on. Okay, So despite that, um, I think word is out and, and students and others are really doing the right thing. Thank you, Dean Stein. Last year, my son caught COVID and was very sick. He ended up taking a major exam while exhibiting significant significant uh, significant symptoms. I'm assuming I don't think he was aware uh, that he could ask the professor. This test resulted in works course grade for the semester. Uh, is the medical staff advising students that the dean's office can help them manage classes when they are seriously ill as a first year student? How would he have known this? So that is that has been part of our process of contact tracing. Um, the contact tracers uh, have a form that they go through with each of the cases, and, and one of the things that they have to check off is that they talk with the students about the um, notifying the dean of students' office uh, when students come to Stamps Health Services, and if they are significantly ill, that is part of the conversation that we have with them as well. Um, is asking if they want the dean of students' office notified. Uh, particularly if they're being placed on, you know, if they're if we're restricting their ability to go. So if they if they have. COVID uh, and need isolation, yes, that's part of our conversation with them. If they uh, um, have the flu or some other infectious illness, that would also be a part of our, our conversation with them. Uh, so yes, we do inform them of that when they're here. My son was denied a call with a doctor for a mild throat pain, even after requesting to a number of times the stamps stress without a COVID test. We cannot help that is really uh, very bad as he should have not been forced uh, when he wanted just a minor medication for his problem. Please explain. Uh, 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 um. I'm not, not sure. sure not, not sure I followed the question completely, but so um, the symptoms of COVID are very variable and oftentimes students present with uh, just a runny nose or just a sore throat. They don't have the full constellation of what people associate with COVID, such as fever, cough, shortness of breath, body aches, fatigue. Um, we have had uh, quite a number of students whose only symptom is a sore throat and they end up testing positive for COVID. So it is part of our protocol that if you have one of the symptoms that might be COVID, that you have to get have a COVID test. Um, you know, students present and they have a sore throat and they only want a strep test. Um, and uh, we do uh, insist that um, they get a COVID test because right now COVID is far more um, common than strep is. Now, we oftentimes, if, 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 if their main complaint is a sore throat, when they come to get their COVID test, we also swab their throat for a strep test at the same time that we do their COVID test. Um, it's not our intent to um, deny anyone care. Um, we do uh, 
uh, um, uh, want to full, consider the full range of things that might cause the student symptoms. So all, very often we will do not only a COVID test, but also other testing if it's indicated. And that might be a strip test, it might be a flu test, um, or anything else. We also, our, our protocol is also a stepwise protocol. Um, students, if they, if they have symptoms that might be COVID, they come in and get a, a COVID, they get a COVID test, and then they have a phone conversation with one, a, a telemedicine visit with one of our providers. And if that provider feels like the student, they cannot um, adequately evaluate the student's issue with a telemedicine appointment, then they will be scheduled for an in-person appointment with one of our providers where they come in and are physically seen. Most upper respiratory um, issues can be dealt with with a telemedicine visit. Um, most, most, most students' symptoms are relatively mild and can be managed with over-the-counter medications. And, um, and a telemedicine appointment is perfectly appropriate for that. But there is a mechanism for students who have more serious disease or they have persistent Ill, uh, symptoms um, or they haven't gotten better, better when we expect them to, to come in for an in-person visit and be seen by, by a provider. Um, but we do ask that students follow the protocol and, and not try to skip steps in that protocol. Are students who are fully vaccinated subject to regular testing? So uh, testing is not required for anybody on campus. Uh, it's highly encouraged, including uh, individuals who are fully vaccinated, particularly with, um, the, with the Omicron variant. We know that um, uh, vaccination does not um, prevent um, sy symptomatic illness. It does reduce the risk, and it definitely reduces the risk of serious illness but it doesn't prevent um, symptomatic illness as well as it did previous um, variants. Um, but we do not mandate or require testing of anybody, vaccinated or unvaccinated. Uh, Dr. Holton, what is the process for a student obtaining a booster shot? Are there walk-up appointments available or should they schedule an appointment um, online? Uh, all appointments for vaccinations are, are, are by appointment. They schedule an appointment through mytest.com gotech.edu. Um, in January, we have had vaccination clinics on Tuesdays and Fridays. Going forward in January, we will have vaccine clinics on Tuesdays. And if there is um, enough demand for vaccines, we'll, we might expand that to additional days. But for right now, it's um, every Tuesday is, is, a, is a COVID vaccination clinic. And Dean Stein, since we, if we could just, uh, and Dr. Holton, just express to your constituents and colleagues that to the faculty on the staff side and the faculty side to just um, encourage our professors to offer a live stream or and recordings um, just in case a student is sick um, to kind of decrease the pressure of a student attending class when they are sick. So we have another concern about that. So we'll just continue to push that to our colleagues. Uh, Dr. Holton, what about other health issues if a student is giving a medication does the staff provide warnings and potential side effects to the students um, once they are uh, kind of handing that over to the student? Um, yes, we do. Uh, as part of the education, uh, anytime we give a medication, we do provide them information about things that they should watch out for that might be that might occur as a result. Also, um, particularly in our pharmacy, um, our pharmacists, when they give a student a medication, if, you know, if a student chooses to get their, medic their prescription filled at our pharmacy, our pharmacists um, review the medication with the student, make sure they understand how to take it, and make sure they understand what um, potential side effects they should watch out for. And I guess according to the CDC, does fully vaccinated mean two doses or the three doses, including, including the booster? So the terminology being used by the CDC right now is that fully vaccinated, the term fully vaccinated means that you receive both doses of a primary series of, va of vaccine. They're using the term up to date on vaccinations to indicate that um, you received both doses of your primary series. And if you are, um, if enough time has elapsed 
since your primary series that you're now eligible for a booster dose that you've had your booster dose. So that would be that uh, that would be the term up to date. If a student uh, became fully vaccinated on campus through our sites here, if they somehow lost their vaccination card, what is the process of, of obtaining a new one? They should reach out to our travel immunization allergy clinic. Um, and uh, we can provide them with a new uh, vaccination card. They can also, if they got their vaccination through Georgia Tech, they can also print out their immunization records um, through their patient portal, and it will include their COVID vaccines. Dr. Halton, we know that uh, we are in the midst of a pandemic as well, but what about we are in the midst of flu season? Uh, are there any flu clinics on campus? Um, how can students kind of get access to the information? So um, we have not had a lot of flu activity on campus. We had some flu activity in the middle of fall semester and then it kind of died away. We've not seen a lot of flu activity on uh, campus so far this spring, knock on wood. Uh, we had, um, I think, three or four flu vaccine clinics in the fall. And then we had a flu vaccine clinic last week, last Wednesday from three to seven. Um, uh, at which students, it, th those were walk-up clinics. Students could just walk in and get their flu vaccine. We are not anticipating having any more this spring semester given the low uh, level of flu activity on campus and the low turnout um, that we had for our flu vaccine clinic last week. However, um, students can schedule an appointment in our travel immunization allergy clinic um, any day, Monday through Friday, to get a flu clinic, uh, to get a flu vaccine and um, Oftentimes, when students come into uh, stamps for another reason, they injured their ankle or they have um, some other issue, um, they can request to get a flu shot while they're here during that appointment. So it doesn't have to be only during our special flu clinics that they get a flu vaccine. Great, thank you so much. Um, one parent has expressed gratitude for hosting this session and both of you taking your time out to join us here today. This has been extremely helpful, they stated. Um, please, uh, as we get ready to end our hour, uh, please keep the questions rolling in. If you have any about COVID um, or just anything related to that, uh, Dean Stein is also here to answer any questions as it relates to student success, transitioning, uh, what are some things that you may have learned about your student over the break uh, that you didn't know? Maybe it's something that they need support with. Uh, we would just love to hear any and all concerns or just questions that you may have. Tyler, let me let me just um, say one thing. So uh, I want to kind of also just uh, talk about how we're functioning in the non-academic side. So we are uh, hosting a number of activities and we already have in the first two weeks of the semester. It is a combination of both in person when we can have it in a place that allows for the proper social distancing and other means uh, and some of it is virtual. OK, so it, it is still where there's a good array of activity that's going on on the campus. Uh, but you, you know, you'll see that some of it uh, we will have in person and then others will just invite students to join and others a virtual kind of experience. Um, but we are committed to continuing a full array of programming through the whole spring semester and holding on to many of the traditions that we typically have in, in spring term. So. Given the increase in crime in many cities and, in, and the increase in gun violence near campus, is there any concern about students going off campus are students safe going to and at the competition center for solo car, robotics, et cetera? Well, let me reassure you that our chief of police and the police force is well aware of uh, you know, the perimeter and the immediate area within the Institute. There are regular kinds of uh, serving of what's going on activity and stuff. Um, and you know that is one area it's it's right off campus uh, but it's uh, uh it's close and so they do cruise around that whole area 
uh, if a student really truly feels uh, completely unsafe in terms of like returning home at a later hour or whatever, they can contact GTPD and uh, they will assist them in getting back to whatever residence they live in and stuff. So there are other, other means to do that if they truly feel like at that point they feel unsafe. Um, look, we're in a major city, so can we guarantee safety? No, honestly. Uh, but what I want to reassure you is that we're taking every means possible uh, in terms of the kind of uh, police force that we have and working with Atlanta police force and giving kind of the right messages to our students to just use common sense to be very careful to not place themselves in situations uh, that could put them at risk. But uh, generally speaking, the campus is safe. When N95 masks are made available to be able to distribute to students, how will they be informed that they are? Yeah, the, the, I would say that SGA really is the lead on this partnering with the um, division. And so SGA will be marketing this. They will push it out and they will let students know where they can go and pick one of those masks up and stuff. So just um, and SGA does that in many different ways. They do it on their website. They'll do it through Instagram. They'll they'll figure it out. And I'm sure the division also will be promoting this. So um, just tell them to to keep an eye out. We don't know exactly when they're going to arrive, so just to kind of watch out. And as soon as it happens, we'll get the word out. Thank you. Dean. Thank you. Dean. Um, Dean Stein, over your years and just through you working with first years and also many years of teaching GT1000, um, what are some things that you have seen that students have uh, kind of blossom in their second semester of being accustomed to Georgia Tech and just what are just some things that you've noticed through their transition from their first semester to their second? Yeah, a good question. Well, that, like the second semester is is a, it's a more difficult semester. I just I met with a first year student yesterday and I said, how's it going? And he's like, wow, it's a little bit different this semester. And I said, how so? And he said, well, you know, I'm taking more kind of difficult classes. And in my first semester, there seemed to be more of a transition time. The first two, three weeks before everything kicked in, he said, no, this semester, first week, everything started happening. So I think as students move into more upper level or uh, courses related to their major um, and, you know, less of the core classes, they find that it's a busier and, you know, potentially more rigorous semester. So uh, the adjustment should be made from the beginning, like in this case, Two weeks in, this student had the insight to that. that. That's working as a plus for that student to have that insight and to make the adjustments. OK, so the good news is that you're more informed about tech. You should be more informed about the support services on campus. If you're not, you should be more informed about who you can talk to to learn about the support services on campus. Right, so more informed, better knowledge. All right, however, as you look at your classes and you see what's expected of you, you have to make the adjustments early and get the help that you need quickly. So, um, you know, we, we do find that that spring semester becomes a little bit more challenging uh, than the first one for students in, in a different way. The first semester is challenging more from adjustment. The second semester challenging more from an academic. Great, great. Um, also kind of sticking on the first year topic to those parents and family members who may be joining us, uh, the spring break conversation. What advice would you give to a parent whose student says, hey mom, I'm going to Miami, I'm going to Colorado, New York for spring break. Instead of coming home, uh, how, how would you advise a parent to kind of handle that conversation who may not have been prepared for it? Yeah, I would say carefully. <laughs> so, uh, no, look, I mean, uh, we're kind of giving you a heads up of what you might be on the receiving end. So don't be shocked by it. Um, you know, a lot of times students just decide last minute, hey, let's all do X, right? Now we're in an interesting moment with COVID and, and who knows where we'll be at that point. But if we can just move that aside for a moment and just speak to the issue itself, 
um, I would say that probably in February at some point, you might want to introduce the question, are you thinking, your, what is your plan for spring break? Do you think you'll be coming home or do you think you'll be doing something else? And see how your student responds to that question. Um, and obviously if they say, I don't know yet, uh, then the answer should be, well, kind of keep us informed as you <laughs> make your plans. Uh, the other piece of it, depending on your student and other issues and stuff, uh, you need to talk through like who's financing this, like who's going to pay for this trip and how much is it going to cost you? I mean, these are just basic questions that, um, you know, parents should be having with their students, um, you know, uh, along the way, right? But it is not uncommon for students to just want to get into a car and drive someplace and spend the week on the beach or something. So. Thank you. Is there any plans to install smartphone wireless charging stations in the study centers? Many students study late in the night and study centers do not always have their cables uh, or chargers with them. Students, excuse me, um, and their phone will run out of power. Is there any alternative uh, for charging smartphones? Great question. Uh, don't know the answer, but very good question and we will follow up with the Dean of the library and Clough and stuff to see what is the situation over there and that's a possibility. Okay. We also have another question that may need to be passed on to our housing constituents. Uh, with the reduction of housing for upperclassmen uh, for the next academic year, would you consider an increased number of in-campus housing for third years? Uh, they had already uh, pretty much had a non-existent first year due to the pandemic and uh, it doesn't seem fair now that it pay, face the possibility of living off campus and not getting a traditional housing experience. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to speak for my colleagues in housing, so that really is a housing related question and we can bring that question to them and get an answer and then maybe you can post it or figure out how to get it out to families. And I see Lacey has already answered the question about uh, campus safety trainings available to students. Um, I have served on a Georgia Tech Police Committee. I know that our GTPD is very engaged and very open to speaking with students, engaging with students, hosting trainings, and even coming to their organizational meetings. Um, we have one of the best GT uh, University Police Departments in the country um, who are very open and engaging. I'm pretty sure Dean Stein can speak to them speak to this as well. Even our chief of police has an open line of communication, willing to speak to parents and students directly. Um, so we are very fortunate to have a very um, active and engaged uh, police department. Yes, and, and GTPD does also have kind of a core group of students that work with them and keep them informed about what's going on on the campus and offer them some suggestions and stuff. So they're very much connected to students through student government, through student leaders, through residence life staff, um, through the students they hire. Uh, and you know, they, they're willing to talk to anybody that really wants to listen to them and learn more about you know, what they do and how they support the campus and support students. So. Dr. Holton, does a student, uh, is a student required to be enrolled within classes during the summer semester to continue with health insurance uh, if a student is doing an online internship from Atlanta? So um, we have to make sure that we are clear about whether we're talking about the health fee and access to care at Stamps Health Services or whether you're talking about health insurance, the student health insurance plan. Uh, the student health insurance plan um, is uh, goes from all, all beginning of August to the end of July. Um, you don't have to be an, a student actively enrolled in campus in the summer to, for the student health insurance plan to remain active. Uh, if you are not enrolled in summer semester as a student, um, you can continue to utilize stamps if you pay the, the summer health fee. Um, but if you don't pay the summer health fee, then you're not eligible for care at, at stamps. Great, thank you so much. 
Dean, Dean Stein, another question for you, um, just through your years of experience. Um, if a student calls home, they're anticipating to graduate this upcoming semester. Um, they say, hey, you know, I don't have it all figured out. I'm not really sure what I want to do. I'm kind of struggling. Um, you know, what, what advice would you give to a parent who student feels that they don't have all the answers in their last semester um, and may just maybe struggling academically and just kind of just going through some real life situations about their next steps? So I, I guess what I would uh, wonder about with that scenario is, you know, is, is the student able, to, is the student believing that he or she will be able to graduate, that they're not going to fail something that will prevent them from graduating? OK, because the scenario is different depending if it's that versus I don't really know what I want to do when I graduate, so should I just stay an extra semester and try and figure it out? That, that's very different than the first, right? right the right. first is a matter of working with your academic advisor and figuring out exactly what you need to qualify to graduate from Georgia Tech. You may have to stay on and retake a class, so it might mean postponing your graduation for one semester, right? Um, now, that gets tricky if students have jobs in hand or have just a plan in place. Uh, if they're not really sure, then you know it may not be as difficult to accept that um, reality. All students who are scheduled to graduate in May should at this point know that they have, are going to meet all of the requirements for graduation pending no major issue with any course this semester. They should check that and double check that with their academic advisor and with the registrar's office. Okay, uh, we're early in the semester that that can be problem solved. If you get six, seven, eight, nine weeks in and this now surfaces, it's much more difficult. So if your student is scheduled to graduate, have them check it. Now, I don't know what I want to do and should I stay on? Well, there I would say there's a number of factors that come into, you know, it, can you afford it? Can the student afford it? Can the family afford to have another semester? All right. Um, if you're going to stay on, what's the plan? It's not to just hang out for another semester. What are you trying to accomplish that semester? And how is that going to bring you to a better place um, that, so that when you do graduate, you'll have a better launching pad, right? Otherwise, you might as well just launch now and take the time to figure it out, um, you know, post graduation. Okay, now we're only in week three. So remember, we still have 13 weeks before they would graduate. There's plenty of time to think through what should my plan be? What do I want to do when I graduate from Georgia Tech? And to speak to some people on campus and career services and their advisor and faculty to maybe get some thoughts on that. So it really depends on what the issue is with the student. And let me just say for families, you're not going to be able to problem solve this. They have to problem solve it on their own. So you're trying to fix it will really not work. OK, but you can kind of help them figure out the steps they need to do to fix it and get the answers they need. Yeah. yeah. So much things, and I would also just encourage you know a student in scenario two to proactively start meeting with our career center, um, engaging in their resources and programs that they have to kind of assess uh, the uh, things that the student is most interested in in terms of the, the job field or maybe graduate school or things of that sort. Um, the career center is a great, great tool that uh, students and especially graduating. Uh, seniors can utilize at free of charge. Uh, we, and we also have a career uh, center webinar this Thursday at 12 p.m. Just kind of talking about our upcoming career fair, um, how you can support your student as a parent or family member um, with their nerves, anxiety, um, some to do, some to don'ts. Um, how should you introduce yourself at a career fair? This will be a very, very insightful webinar. Um, so highly encourage you to join us this Thursday at 12 p.m. Um, and with that, and with that being, I want to go back to one thing. I started with the leadership coaching. In the scenario we're talking about, even a graduating student can sign up for that leadership coaching, and actually that might be very beneficial. 
in terms of helping someone, helping the student think through the possibilities of the future. So it's not only for first or second year students, you can do this and there are graduate students that sign up for the leadership coaching. So that would be another place to kind of direct the student. Great. Um, parent would just like to say, hey, thank you to Dr. Holton and Dean Stein. Um, this situation has been very exhausting the past couple of years, so thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you for answering the same questions over and over. Uh, thank you for helping our children become adults and launch successfully. Uh, it will be very easy for you to just give sar sarcastic responses and maybe laugh at clueless parents and immature students, but thank you for just doing all that you do with the patience and decorum, and I think that's just a great way to kind of close out. Um, Dean Stein, if you have any remarks as well. Well, no, I mean, I, I, you know, on behalf of Dr. Holton myself, I say thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for that uh, comment that the parent made. Um, I always say we're in partnership with each other. Uh, your student success is our success with that student. So uh, we're in this together and be safe and take care of yourselves and uh, thank you. Yes, and we know that this information uh, that was shared today was very insightful. Uh, so please know that this webinar will be recorded and posted to our website parents.gatech.edu within the next 24 hours and on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, so thank you for joining us and we hope that we see you Thursday uh, for our very, very um, exciting and insightful webinar from the director of our career center, Laura Garcia, uh, just talking about our upcoming career fair and the next steps for your students to make them successful. Thank you so much. Have a good day and go Jackets.